And welcome to the seventh of our First in South Carolina lectures. Uh, tonight's speaker is Stephen G. Hoffius, who is a native of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a graduate of Duke University. Steve is the author of Winners and Losers, a prize-winning novel for young adults. He's a freelance editor who has co-edited The Life and Art of Alfred Huddy, Woodstock to Charleston with Sarah Arnold, Northern Money, Southern Land, with Robert Cuthbert, and The Landscape of Slavery, The Plantation in American Art with Angela Mack. Steve is currently the managing, managing editor of Home House Press, uh, which is located in Charleston, which published another of his books titled Civil War in South Carolina, Selections from the South Carolina Historical Magazine, which he co-edited with Larry Rowland. For 12 years, Steve served as Director of Publications for the South Carolina Historical Society. He now works with a number of authors, helping them prepare manuscripts for print. Steve has contributed to the New York Times, Christian Science Monitor, and the Charlotte Observer. Please welcome Steve Hoffius. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thanks all of you for coming tonight. Um, of all of the things that were just said, um, managing editor of Home House Press is what I am representing tonight. Uh, it's a tiny little publishing company. It's only been around for three years. We've published six books, two a year. Every once in a while, we think we'll speed it up to three, and it's just too much. So we st stay at two. And how? USC Press or any of the larger presses can put out dozens a year is totally beyond me because two seems like plenty. Um, and uh, we have some of the books, all six of the books that we've done in the back of the room uh, if you'd like to look them over. Uh, two of them, uh, three of them are actually based on things connected with the Historical Society. The book on the Civil War, another book on Barbados in South Carolina that's also taken from articles in the historical magazine, and then uh, the Shaftesbury Papers, which are the earliest documents about South Carolina from uh, the 17th century, uh, is a reprint of a book that was first published by the Historical Society in the 19th century. So we have lots of ties to the society. But what I'm going to talk about tonight is a book that has not yet come out on a subject that has not yet been written about as much as it should be, and that's the period of Reconstruction. Reconstruction, you all know this, and I'm going to give you a real quick summary, is basically the time period from the end of the war, 1865, I don't have to say which war, to um, 1876, to the election in 1876. And the most dramatic time period is that last year before the election in 1876, when all hell breaks loose in South Carolina. And South Carolina is the scene of comedy and farce and tragedy and drama. There is nothing but high drama in South Carolina in 75 and 76 and then in 77. And if you read much about it, what you come across periodically, because it's quoted by lots of historians, are a series of articles that were published in the Atlantic Monthly in 76 and 77, and one of them in 78. There were four articles that were published during that period, and they did not have a name on them. They said they were published by a native South Carolinian who is not a Republican. The Republicans at the time, everything was backwards. The Republicans at the time, were that was the party of African Americans. Almost all white South Carolinians were Democrats. Um, very few whites were in the Democratic, or in the Republican Party, but there were some, both Northerners and local people who were members of the party. But it went out of its way in, the, in Atlantic to say he is not a Republican, because much of what he wrote about was condemning the Democrats. But he wasn't a Republican. In fact, if you read the very first of those articles, it is nothing but condemnation of the Republicans. It just goes on and on about the corruption 
that was going on in South Carolina um, in uh, especially like 72 to 74 and the railroad bonds and the amount of money that was being wasted on um, things to decorate the offices of the General Assembly um, and the, the amount of taxes that were increased and the inability of people to pay for them. So if you read those first several paragraphs of that first article, you think whoever is writing this is just out to get the Republicans. They say he's not a Republican, and clearly he's out to get them. But wait, he says at that point. Now let's look at the other side. And at that point, he starts condemning the Democrats and the violence that is being wrought, especially on African Americans, but on Republicans in general. And he just goes down one after another after another, saying things that everybody in South Carolina knew, but nobody was saying to each other. And they certainly weren't publishing them in national magazines. Now, if anybody had, had written those things and published those things, from Boston, from Philadelphia, from New York, they would have been condemned and they would never have been allowed south of Richmond. It came out later on that the articles were being written by a young man, 21 years old, a white man from Florence, South Carolina, a lawyer who had just gone to South Carolina College, which is now the University of South Carolina. He was friends with lots of people who were in the legislature. He was in the inner circles of white power in South Carolina, and yet he was writing these condemning things. In the very first article, he wrote this wonderful quote, and I think, how the hell did he get away with that? There used to prevail in the South an inquisitorial, relentless determination to suppress the truth about the maltreatment of the slaves. Atrocities were frequently perpetrated, yet it was persistently asserted that the Negroes were uniformly well-treated, were contented and happy, and that all reports to the contrary were malicious lies invented by interested politicians or crazy fanatics. While there are few Southerners who could not have written an abler vindication of Uncle Tom's Cabin than its authoress, and he does that kind of thing all the time. He makes it really clear that he knows better than anybody on any subject. And Stowe knew nothing about what she wrote about it. I could have written better, he, he suggests. On every hand, she was denounced as a busybody, a mischief maker, a fanatic, a lunatic, a liar of the first magnitude. And yet I have heard Southerners who in formal argument would deny the possibility of any and every event in her matchless expo expose. In moments of jo jovial conversation, they relate with great gusto anecdotes of how in the good old times, they used to hunt down runaway Negroes with hounds and guns. They would brand them, beat them until senseless, and while patrolling at night, they would flog Negroes who had passes, quote, just to hear them beg and hello. But that's all gone now, they remark with a sigh on concluding. I mean, he was blowing the whistle on everything that was going on in South Carolina and in the rest of the South. And in doing so, he was both condemning one side and the other side. It was like the, the only impartial statement balanced statement on Reconstruction that would be published for about 150 years. It was just a remarkable thing. Well, it turns out they were published, in the four of them in the Atlantic and two others in the New York Tribune, and they have never been collected before until now, and we're putting them out, and they should be out in another month or two. Um, and the, we're calling it when South Carolina was an armed camp because that's what he talks about over and over again, is how in 75 and 76, everybody in South Carolina has guns, and they are all marching in the squares and in the parks. They are practicing, they're having guns shipped in. One passing through South Carolina would imagine that it was in a state of war. 
It resembles a vast armed camp. On every green and public square, the clang of muskets can be heard as parading infantry ground their arms. From every old field rings out threateningly the note of the bugle or the booming of the field piece as cavalry and artillery perform their evaluations. The depots are crowded with cases of firearms ordered from the north. Now this wasn't appearing in any other publication in the south or in the north. And when it came out, people in the south said, oh no, or in South Carolina said, no, no, that's not going on. But he identifies exactly where it's going on. And a lot of what he's writing about is actually based on clippings that he's finding from the News and Courier that he's reading in Florence. Frank Warrington De uh, Dawson, who was the editor of the News and Courier, was very much like this man, whose name is Belton O'Neill Townsend. They were like two peas in a pod, except that eventually, in 1876, there was a series of outrages and massacres that took place across the state. And Dawson's immediate reaction was to condemn it in the News and Courier. And then he discovered that he was going to lose all of his subscribers and most of his advertisers if he did that. And so he totally switched. Now the massacre happened, there was a series of them all across South Carolina. Hamburg was the worst and was condemned all through the country. And then Ellington and Canehoy and Charleston, there were actually two riots in Charleston, in downtown Charleston in 1876, in the buildup to the election that was in the fall. In most of the instances, whites were massacring blacks. In Canehoy, there were many more blacks who were killed and, or uh, many more whites who were killed or injured than blacks. They were going at each other in all of these instances. They're building up to the election that you kind of remember but has been forgotten a lot. And that was the one when Wade Hampton was being drafted to run for governor. And he's running against the incumbent, who was a Yankee named Daniel Chamberlain, who came down right after the war. And he was farming. He had the notion that almost every Union soldier had, seemed to have, that they could come down and, and make millions um, planting in the South. It's amazing the number of Yankee soldiers who came down, saw the South, and then moved down to live after that. Well, he eventually got recruited. Chamberlain was recruited to go run for the legislature, and then he became attorney general, and eventually he was run for governor. Frank Dawson at first supported Chamberlain, and then after Hamburg, he switched and supported Hampton. Again, because he saw that he was going to be the only white person in South Carolina who was supporting the Republican at that point. There was a campaign all around the South, all around the state, and there was Chamberlain going around and making speeches, but there were also others going around on his behalf, and they were being led by Martin Gary, who was a Union, or a, a Confederate general, and a number of other people, and they came up with a policy that we will not accept any compromise with the Republican Party, that it's so evil that there is no way that we'll work together. Well, that was what Dawson with the News and Courier was trying to push, was a compromise. Let's work together and get the best of both parties. The, uh, this other group, the straight outs, were saying, no, we are not going to put up with it at all. And they adopted what was called the Mississippi Plan, which had been done in Mississippi the year before. And what they were pushing was, we are going to intimidate black people in South Carolina to such an extent that they are not going to dare to vote. They are not going to go to the polling places because black people were the vast majority of South Carolina. Charleston County was probably about three to one black to white. So if it were a fair election, it was not going to be uh, it was not going to be the Democrats who would win that one. Now, in response, the Democrats did a lot of crooked things, too. And again, uh, Belton O'Neill Townsend talks about that as well. It is the most corrupt election that
that South Carolina has ever had, and it will stand up against elections in Louisiana or Chicago or almost anywhere else. And as we're approaching it, this young guy, 21 years old, starts writing this article. He writes up to William Dean Howells, who is the editor of uh, the Atlantic Monthly, and of course is one of the most respected uh, authors, novelists, in the country at that point. And he sends up this really long manuscript, and Howells immediately writes back, starts to write back, and says, there's no way that we can publish this. We come out monthly, and yours is way more timely than that. And just as he's writing that letter, he pauses and says, now wait a minute, I just looked it over again, and we still can't use it because of the schedule, but this is really good. And so he sends it on to the New York Tribune, and they publish it on October 14th, and on more of it on October 16th, as we're building up to the election. They want, it's a daily newspaper, they want something timely, even if the Atlantic doesn't. That comes out, and then Howells and uh, Belton O'Neill Townsend work together to come up with four more articles that run in the Atlantic Monthly. And a lot of what he says, of what Townsend says about Reconstruction at the time, it, that's going on here, is that there was huge corruption in the Democratic Party, especially under Governor Moses, who was just ridiculously corrupt. In fact, there is a biography that just came out in the last couple of years that's defending Governor Moses, and what it says is he was as corrupt as everybody else around him. No more. <laughs> that's the defense. That's the best that anybody can come up with for him. There was huge corruption, but one of the reasons Chamberlain got elected was tried to trying to end that, and he was doing it, um, among other things, there's a great quotation, if I can find it, about how um, um, there were as many Democrats in the state government as there were Republicans, because Chamberlain was reaching out to everybody to work with whoever would further the state. He says that white people trusted Chamberlain. White people were satisfied with Chamberlain. White people were doing what Frank Dawson was saying, which is working for Chamberlain because with, with the population the way it was, the Democrats were clearly going to win. The only way that they wouldn't win is if it were a totally corrupt election. So let's work with the best elements of the Democratic Party. And he says that that's exactly what was going on at the time until Gary comes along and says, we can't put up with this, and they start this huge straight-out campaign. One of the things that I think that's interesting about this is that he is so flawed, he is so racist, it is astounding, and he is so frank about it. Black people, their food is coarse and barbarously prepared. Their homes are dens of filth, giving off an intolerable stench. Their clothing is simply disgusting. This is their friend. He says about low-income whites, they are squalid, lazy, and extremely ignorant. He is clearly not taking the party line on anything that he is writing. The Negro, he says, not standing very high anyhow biologically, is, when aroused, a wild beast. There is not the slightest doubt that in the use of the handy billy, which is the club, and the torch, he is an expert of the first order, and as if he doesn't seem racist enough. And it is probable that in the murder of women and children, he can equal the Indian. I mean, he has so many flaws in it, and yet he is going out of his way to condemn both the extremists on both ends of the spectrum in the state government. So the four articles come out. The last one comes out way after the end of the election, and now he is saying, I can't decide if it's good or bad. Hampton uh, became the governor of South Carolina, basically, it was a tie vote. 
Um, there are a lot of counties, Edgefield area, that were so corrupt they couldn't figure out what to do with this, them. Maybe just throw them out uh, because, because they couldn't trust any. They kept finding all of these ballot boxes that were just stuffed with, with way more votes than there were people to vote. So what to do about that? Well, at the same time, the national election was the same way. The Democrat was, um, um, the Republican was Tilden, the Democrat was Rutherford B. Hayes, one was the governor of New York, the other the governor of Ohio. Did I get them switched? I got them switched. And the deal that was struck, and they went on and on to try to figure this, was that they gave the national election to the Republican, to Rutherford B. Hayes, with the understanding that the troops would be taken out of South Carolina, and South Carolina, the governorship would be given to Wade Hampton, the Democrat. And with the troops taken out of here, um, all black people who had been elected to the legislature, they did new votes on it, and they were all taken out, and one by one, they were taking black people out of the positions of leadership. The schools um, had had, uh, South Carolina College had had, uh, was virtually all black. Uh, now they were all kicked out. The police force in Charleston had lots of black officers. They were all taken out from it. Um, there was just a total switch that much of which happened right in 76 or 77, um, but it kept on changing in the 80s. Uh, in 86, they're still making those changes. They're trying to get rid of the last Republicans that are still in the post office in Charleston and the Customs House and the various places. And he says, I can't decide if it's good or bad. We don't have violence in the streets anymore the way we did. We don't have murders happening the way we did. It's calm, but on the other hand, there's a move to put black people back into a position approaching slavery. So um, I'm torn on it right now. He then turns his focus almost entirely to Florence, and he becomes one of the founders of Florence County, making the city of Florence the, um, the head of the, of the county. Um, he does not get to celebrate that because he's also a drunk. And he is drunk in a hotel room when the state legislature is voting on making Florence a county. He's been working on this for years, and when he finally gets his victory, he's not there to celebrate it. In Florence, he is founding the library. He's starting drama clubs. He is... Um, um, working for the Betterman. He's, he's the head of a Masonic Lodge. He's doing all of these great things for Florence. And in his spare time, he is writing a poem that really is what he most wants to do. He uh, has wanted to be a poet since he was in college. He wants to be a writer, but he especially wants to be a poet. And he realizes that he has just gone through a dramatic period that, that just stands up to any dramatic period in the history of the country, and that is Reconstruction. So he decides to write an epic poem about Reconstruction, and he sends it up to William Dean Howells, and Howells says, you're a really good writer, but this isn't. This is terrible. You are not a poet. Do not publish this, no matter what you do. He writes to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and he just kind of bows down in front of him. And Longfellow's ill, but his brother writes back and says, um, I, I, we can't comment on it. It's just a brush off letter. Um, you should write what you know about. Don't bother us again. But he is so taken with his own words that he decides to publish them himself. And so he goes to a printer in Columbia, and he prints up this little booklet of um, of poems, in, and more than half of it is this epic poem on Reconstruction. And he sends books to everybody he can think of. Every great poet in England gets one. It's now in the Library of Congress. It's in library. It's in uh, Oxford. Um, he sends it to the governor. He sends it to the president. He's sending books to everybody. He sends it, of course, to William Dean Howells, who had been his mentor. And Howells writes back and says, 
oh my God, I can't believe you did that. I told you that that is a terrible book of poetry. You've got lots of skills, but that's not the area, and I wish you hadn't done it. Well, he also puts together a little booklet of statements and praise for this book, and he takes odd sentences that William Dean Howells has written him and that Samuel Longfellow wrote to him. My wife and I talk a lot about a, a cartoon that appeared a long time ago where a man is chewing out his dog and says, bad dog, that's a terrible thing to do. I love you, but I hate it when you do that. And all the dog hears is, I love you. And that's what he did with all of these um, letters of, of condemnation mixed with a little praise. He pulls the praise out and he publishes them in a book and he sends the book to all kinds of people and he gets all these polite letters, including one from George Walton Williams of Charleston, South Carolina. And, and he takes the, the little bit of praise and he puts it into this thing and he sends that around with, with the book. So when a copy of the book gets to Mark Twain, Mark Twain immediately writes to his good friend, William Dean Howells, and says, good land, have you seen the poems of that South Carolinian idiot, Belton O'Neill Townsend? And above all, have you seen the dedication of them to you? If you did write him what he says you did, you, did, you richly deserve hanging. <laughs> and if you didn't, he deserves hanging. But he deserves hanging anyway, and in any and all cases. No, boiling, gutting, brazing in a mortar. No, no, there is no death that can meet his case. Now think of this literary louse dedicating his garbage to you and quoting encouraging compliments from you and poor dead Longfellow. Let us hope there is a hell for this poet's sake who carries his bowels in his skull and when they operate, works the discharge into rhyme and prints it. Now clearly, that's overstated. It's <laughs> gotta be overstated. So I'll let you make your own decision. This is the beginning of the poem, which is entitled, Wild With All Regret. I'll not invoke the muses, but with a sheriff's sale, a very homely matter, you may think will start my tale. Yet there is not a subject you can find in all romance more tragic than the auction of an old inheritance. The Berkeleys were a family whose name from earliest age of Carolina's annals appears on every page. And it goes on, it is 8,000 words, it just goes on and on and on. And some of it may be familiar to you. There is the beautiful and pure Allie, who is also insane, her aged and loyal nurse, Chloe, her beloved and courageous, Willie, who eventually joins with other red-clad horsemen, clearly the red shirts of Wade Hampton, to avenge her. And there is the scoundrel Republican Whitmire, there is no suggestion that violence against blacks is a bad thing. Everything in the book is how awful the Republicans have been and how evil they are in trying to take our homes away from us. And rising up with the red shirts is the only thing that we can do. Um, Chloe, her home is taken over by the Republicans and she finally decides that the only thing that she can do to try to strike back is to dynamite it, at which point our poet goes into this long uh, praise of dynamite in all situations. Dynamite was useful with Brutus, with Gessler from the William Tell legend. Dynamite would be good, was good uh, standing against Caesar, and if we need to stand against Jay Gould and Cornelius Vanderbilt, Dynamite, that's what we need. Oh, take the awful tyrant whom the Russians called the Tsar with his knout, police, and army and Siberian mines 
afar, and take the wailing people ever cowering in affright, and can you blame them turning in despair to dynamite? <laughs> he goes on and on and on with this. Well, that was published in 1884. A year later, he got married to Leah McClenahan, apparently because he had shot another suitor of hers, and the only way to keep her from testifying against him was to marry her. <laughs> and they do. They have uh, three children, one of whom uh, is uh, Leah Townsend, who is very well known in South Carolina as, and we're in the right place, as the historian of the South Carolina Baptist Church. She did her dissertation on it. She did her book on the history of the Baptist Church and she is still quoted on a regular basis. Well, that was his daughter. And you will be surprised to hear it was not a happy marriage. Um, there are newspaper clippings in Florence that often appear saying that she has moved out, she is living somewhere else, um, and eventually, while she is living elsewhere, the entire house in which he alone is living burns to the ground uh, when they finally get in there, the only door in the house that is locked is the one to his bedroom. His body is eventually found there. He has put a bullet through his head. Um, and, uh, and the life of Belton O'Neill Townsend is over. But he has left these six articles on Reconstruction writing things that nobody else in South Carolina or in the South dared to write, and William Dean Howells was exactly right. He did a remarkable job at the time, but what he really put all of his effort, or, or much of his effort into, was this god-awful poetry. Now, the book that we're going to put out reprints all of the articles, and the, the person who, who put it together, John Hammond Moore, recommended that we print the entire book of poetry and I thought, we really don't need to do that. But you take the epic poem about Reconstruction and you put it in two columns on a page and you can get away with a whole lot fewer pages than you otherwise would do. And that's what we've done and the book should be out in two months. And in fact, at the back table, we'll have some sheets for you if you want to be notified when the book comes out, we'll let you know. But thank you so much for coming. And I would be glad to answer questions if I can, but I also would be glad to hear comments because I know that half the people here have relatives who went through Reconstruction and passed tales down, and I'd be glad to hear those. Yes? He actually talked critically, he, he wrote about it, and uh, he wrote it in essays, about how he was put down in college for not being from a more elitist family. He felt like he was being punished by the true elites in South Carolina. So he's kind of, he's not in the planter class, He's clearly not poverty-stricken. He celebrates his position above those low-income blacks and whites that you're talking about. And I think he's got a mixed feeling as to whether or not he wants to be one of those wealthy um, planters or people above him. He shoots himself in the foot on a regular basis. He runs for office with positions that he can't possibly be elected by. Uh, elected for, he actually didn't want to be a lawyer in the first place. His father made him do that. His notion on how he would support himself was writing poetry and how he was going to do that, especially with the poetry that he's offering. 
is anybody's guess. As a publisher, how do you um, judge and uh, temper a 21 year old right nut to know how much of what he writes is actually historically accurate? In this instance, there's been a, enough written on Reconstruction that you can um, look back at, at other things. And when he is actually stating something, when he gives a date, he's pretty accurate on it. I mean, he may say early May, and it was actually April 29th, but he's pretty close to what it's been. And the actual events that he's, been, that he's describing are documented elsewhere. Part of what is interesting on him is he loves to philosophize and go on and talk about all kinds of sociological details that nobody can, can um, conjure up today and nobody wrote about at the time, about cooking and, and um, um, housing and, and all kinds of comments about the way people actually lived. Um, he's quoted enough by reputable historians um, that I know that they are looking forward to seeing more of his work and when we can double check it, he's been accurate on, on all counts. I'd love to hear how Dr. George Williams deals with people like that. I mean, his career. Phil, give him a passing grade. Did he set fire to his house? Yes, he did. That is the assumption. And he did um, uh, a a black child who was waiting on him earlier in the day had seen the gun underneath his pillow um, uh, when he dismissed the child and locked the door and locked himself into it. I loved coming across, you can imagine, I'm reading this brochure and it's got all of these halfway warm quotes about it, and there is G.W. Williams right in it. I thought, oh my God, I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and I know just who to share this with. How old was he when he died? Uh, 36. Uh, yeah, she went on. She was, one, she was fascinating and, and was a very good friend of Anne King Gregory, who used to be the head of uh, the Historical Society. Uh, I think the other children married and stayed in the Florence area, but I'm not certain. Yeah. Can you talk a little about the Sure, sure. Um, that was kind of, mar I, I think it's a real interesting uh, thing. And today we kind of glorify, the, and lots of people glorify the red shirts as being these true patriots, but there, uh, there were a group of people who, of course, dressed up in red shirts and went around uh, terrorizing uh, blacks and, and uh, telling them about how they, they can't go out and vote. And if they do, they'll come back and do terrible things to them. Uh, and these are kind of people who were kind of put together by Gary. And it was a movement all through the state. Um, uh, it started with a couple of people, Matthew Butler and Gary, and then it grew and grew. And it was all over the state. And they were. Um, the part of the fascinating question is the extent to which they were doing the orders of Hampton. Uh, and uh, Hampton, again, is often regarded now as being this glorious figure who we admire. And um, Townsend had no um, uh, respect for him. At the head of the um, Democratic Party, nominated for governor, he wrote, stands Wade Hampton, the aristocrat of the aristocrats, the fire eater of the fire eaters, a famous general in the Confederate Army, the reincarnation of Calhounism, Jeff Davisism, anti-Northism, and Southern intolerance. Now his reputation today is that he reached out, which he did, in his speeches to black people saying, um, just because white people are going to take over the government doesn't mean that we are going to put you back into slavery and all the rights that you now know that you have, you will continue to have. The mission of the red shirts was exactly the opposite. Um, the two possibilities are that Hampton uh, was not aware of what thousands of red shirts all around the state were doing. Um, 
or that Hampton knew about it and chose to look the other way and, and let uh, Reconstruction be overthrown as he in fact did. And I think Townsend would have said he knew exactly what he was doing. He was making those statements because he knew that they would play well at the time. Walter. One of them was on Broad Street, and the other one was at Marion Square. There's a great article in the um, historical magazine several years ago that talked about the Canehoy riot and about the two Charleston riots. Melinda Meeks Hennessy wrote it, and it's still the best thing that's been done on the subject. And in the, uh, the fear that white people had in Charleston and there are lots of quotations, I mean, whether or not they're real is anybody's guess, about how black people at the time were saying, you know, things like the uh, Denmark Vesey thing, we're gonna, we're gonna wipe everybody out, we are going to um, uh, get any white person on the street right now. Uh, and I think legitimately they, they had a fear uh, of what was gonna happen. I mean, then the riots were if you, if you haven't read the article and you haven't read the newspaper accounts of those, they're really fascinating and worth looking at. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>